Hello everyone and welcome to week two of Archaeological Illustration. Again, my name is Emily. Um, first, I wanted to apologize uh, for the short week one. A um, little bit of a learning curve for me. Um, and to also clarify um, some things on the drawings. So the drawing activities each week are completely optional. They do not count towards your certificate. However, I would like you to try these activities even if you don't turn in a draft to me. Um, this is a very practical course and actually getting into it and drawing will be the best way to practice and level up your skills. Of course, you can always submit them to me um, and I will be happy to give you feedback on them if that is what you would like. Now, without further ado, we get into week two. Today's lecture is going through the basics of archaeological illustration. We will cover the tools and rules every good illustration contains. We will go through which tools are essential to every illustrator and what they're used for. We will also examine the different kinds of archaeological illustration. We will explore the meaning of archaeological representation and the aims of illustration within archaeology because every illustration has a different aim. And finally, we will go over the two basic steps for creating an archaeological illustration. So, tools for archaeological illustration. Um, up here in the left corner, I have what is called a process square. It's helpful um, for straight edges. It's helpful if you're um, trying to flip your profile without having to draw the whole thing over again. Um, which I will show you next week when we get into ceramics. Um, and then I have your 2B pencil, which is my favorite to use. Um, two different kinds of erasers, a um, felt tipped pen, one of the clamps, which is important when you're using um, tracing paper to go over your graph paper drawing. I've got a little ball of blue tack up there um, because when you have smaller artifacts that maybe aren't sitting the way you want them to on the paper when you're trying to draw, you can use the blue tack to situate them um, so that they stay where you want them to without harming the artifact. And then of course, pencil sharpener. And in my wonderful photo, I forgot one of my most important tools, a ruler. Um, this one is metal. It's a little more durable um, and I can use it for more things than just a plastic one, um, but a ruler will be very helpful also. So the next tool we have, these are a little more um, heavy duty tools for maybe professional illustrators. So this is what's called a profile gauge. Um, as you can see in the picture, it's used for profiles of pottery or more complex profiles of objects that uh, perhaps are harder to freehand or um, eyeball. And then we have what is called a caliper, which is used for measuring um, the thickness of artifacts. So um, you can use it a lot when you're drawing lithics. Um, because you want to make sure that you have the measurements exactly correct and you can kind of get it around um, those edges and it'll tell you on the sliding gauge um, what your measurement is instead of using a ruler, um, which is not as accurate for things like lithics when you're trying to get the width of them uh, because, you know, it may move. Um, you may eyeball it a little differently than somebody else. So those are also um, very important tools. So of course, these are just basic tools. Um, the more you get into different types of illustrations, the more tools you're gonna have, but these are kind of essentials, like a starter kit basically for archeological illustration. Um, so now that we've gone over tools, there are a few basic rules um, to any archeological illustration. So tools and rules for every archeological illustration. Um, there are, of course, other rules for 
the different types of drawings, um, but we will get into those in the following weeks. So every drawing must, must, must include a scale bar. You always have to have a scale bar to make sure um, you know how big the object is. If you've scaled it down from its original size, it's very important um, for accuracy. You also must um, have the light you're using for uh, shading an artifact or just for drawing it at a 45 degree angle from the left side. That, um, that rule kind of transcends um, borders. Um, everybody uses it. Um, that's just how it's done. And then, um, of course, you need to have the object source information on your drawing. Um, I've actually a few times forgotten to put the information um, at the very beginning when I start illustrating of what I'm drawing and later I had to go back and do all these steps to try and um, find the artifact that I in fact had been drawing instead of just writing it down at the very beginning before I did anything else. So types of archaeological illustration. There are many different types. There's artifact illustration, which um, is, you know, your basic um, illustrations of ceramics, um, lithics like lithic tools, bones, metal or glass objects. Um, then you also have site plans, which can include um, site maps, um, stratigraphy drawings, or stratigraphic site plans. Um, as you can see in the bottom is a stratigraphic drawing of a site um, in Egypt. And then um, you have reconstruction drawings. Um, these can be as simple as reconstructing an artifact, such as a rim shirt, um, or they can be as elaborate as reconstructing an entire site that maybe you only have half of left. And then there are also 3D models and videos. So archeological representation. Um, all depictions of archaeological things fall under two different types of representation. Academic representations, where we have archaeological illustration, um, and then non-academic representations, which are things like art, literature, film, advertising, games, um, etc. Um, this is an example of a non-academic drawing. Although it is historical, it is not um, factual. Um, here's another one you may be familiar with in Assassin's Creed, although it is a historical game. Um, it's not exactly accurate. So the latter type is not concerned with science um, or authenticity or accuracy. Both of these categories obviously have different aims. Um, what we're concerned with are the aims and objectives of academic representation. So how do you decide, decide what those aims and objectives are? Um, so the way you decide is you have two questions. Who is your audience um, and what is the purpose of your drawing? Um, what is the illustration being used for? Once you know these things, you can better decide uh, what format to use for your illustration, or perhaps you've been given the format by the person who has hired you to do the illustration. Um, so you have your audience, um, academic or non-academic, and then you have your purpose, um, primary purpose and accurate scientific record, secondary to learn more about the subject in the illustration. So getting into a little bit about audience and purpose, there are two different types of audiences. An academic audience, um, which is what we will be drawing our illustrations to, which would be a class, um, an article in a journal, a book, or for a conference. And then you have your general audience, which is things like museum displays, websites, documentaries, um, etc. So once you've decided who your audience is, you can decide um, on your purpose. So what is our purpose? Our primary purpose is to create an accurate and scientific um, objective record of our findings. Secondly, it is to learn more about the object or the site. And as we learned in week one, 
we can use collections of illustrations to compare and contrast artifacts, which is very important for asking and answering questions. So something important to note is that when we say scientific illustration or representation, we're not just talking about artifacts and sites. These can also include reconstructions or visualizations. These representations are helpful because um, they can reconstruct aspects of daily life in the past. So finally, there are two main steps to creating a valuable or uh, good <laughs> illustration. So the two main steps, obviously there are a lot of steps in creating an illustration, but these are the two main ones um, to follow and you can, you know, create something usable to work with every time. So step one is recording. This is observation and note taking, um, taking measurements, possibly doing some rough sketches, and these can be done in the field or in the lab. Um, so the more measurements and notes you have, the more accurate your illustration is. And it may seem tedious, but sometimes you're not able to finish an illustration um, in the field or in the lab. You don't have enough time or something comes up. You have to move on to something else. Um, and so taking down these measurements and rough sketches is really helpful for coming back later uh, to finish your illustration. So you will use different techniques for step one um, based on what's available, what's been requested of you, what's practical in the moment, you know, for example, like uh, what you have on you if you're in the field, um, what type of weather is happening, some field scenarios, you can have an iPad and you can sketch that way in the field. Some are not really practical for using an iPad in the field, such as um, wetter or hotter conditions. So the aim of step one is to collect as much data as you think you might need. Um, you can never have too much data. So step two, presentation or representation. This is where you choose your final medium. You choose which details you want to record in your illustration um, because obviously you can't record them all. Um, so you have to decide what's important. Um, and hopefully if you've done everything right, you will have an informed and effective presentation. So um, I hope this has been helpful. I know it was a little quick, um, but you know you can always go back to the readings that um, I have posted on Google Classroom for you, or um, feel free to ask me questions anytime. Um, post it on Google Classroom. Um, I'm usually available to answer questions if you have them. Um, and also a lot of these tools and rules will be getting into the nitty gritty um, in the next few weeks when we break down illustrations by subject. So um, next week, week three, we'll be illustrating ceramics. I'm so excited for you guys to do this. Um, ceramics are my absolute favorite thing to illustrate. Um, not that other things aren't fun, but it just happens to be my favorite. And so I'm very excited to get into week three with you guys. Um, don't forget the quiz opens up um, this Friday. And also there's another activity being posted this week for you guys to try your hand at illustration. Um, just find something around your house. If you don't happen to have any room shirts or, you know, um, pottery, um, any lithics at your house, things like, um, plant pots or vases, you can actually do the whole thing. Um, I don't want you breaking your stuff. So, um, you know, you might have to get a little creative um, as we're not in a lab setting with actual artifacts. Um, there's actually, I found some rocks that almost look like lithics sometimes um, that you can pick up and draw. Um, if you have any metal or glass objects like glass beads, um, those are things you can also draw um, in this week's activity. Um, and I am more than happy to provide feedback if you actually submit those. Um, I don't have a problem with that at all. I love seeing everybody's drawings. Um, so I can't wait to get into week three with you guys and thank you for joining me for week two.